Hello there, everyone. This is Eugene Lee Show, and welcome to Forensics Talks. This is episode 60, and today my guest is Dr. Jeffrey Mutart, who's going to be talking to us about human factors, especially as they are applied to vehicle accidents. And I think what's interesting about Jeff's work is that it has applications in many other areas, uh, not just in accident reconstruction. So uh, I'll be asking him about a lot of his research and that sort of thing. But first, uh, don't forget, we are uh, live streaming to YouTube, to Facebook, LinkedIn, and uh, there is a comment section for uh, many of you who are on YouTube. So you can just go ahead and, you know, punch in any comments or questions. And of course, the thing that I always like to uh, find out about is where are people from and where they're watching from. And there's even a few people now that I recognize they're regulars here. I'm going to have to get them a, a points card or something because they keep showing up. So uh, thank thanks for that. Um, just one announcement uh, just very quickly here, and that is that I do have a Cloud Compare course that's coming up. That seems to be a very popular class. And for those of you that are working with 3D data, whether it's like laser scanners or photogrammetry or structured light scanners, whatever it might be, uh, Cloud Compare is a fantastic program for combining data together from different sources and just doing different types of analysis, whether it's uh, just simple measurement type stuff, uh, taking cross sections of vehicles, uh, using it for uh, registering data together or making true 3D comparisons, uh, doing a type of deviation analysis. So I'll be covering all that stuff next week. And if you're interested, uh, you can just head over to my website here. Um, it's one of the first graphics that comes up. You just click on it, fill in the form. There's a little video there. I explain some of the things that are on the course and such. So uh, I'll leave that with you. And you're more than welcome to uh, just email me if you have any questions or anything like that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get into it. And so... Um, Let's talk about Jeff Mutart. And uh, uh, Dr. Mutart began his career as a crash, uh, crash reconstructionist with the police and advanced his career to be internationally recognized for his research related to driver behaviors. And Jeff has a PhD in industrial engineering and oper operations research and a master's degree in experimental psychology, where his research focused on driver and pedestrian response behaviors to traffic safety. He's authored more than 50 peer-reviewed publications relating to traffic safety and driver response in crash and near crash events. His work has been cited in courts throughout the world numerous times, and other, research of, other researchers have cited his work over 200 times. He's earned the status of uh, as a recognized peer reviewer for most prestigious journals in the field of traffic safety, and uh, he's been an invited lecturer and has taught classes on human factors related to driving on more than 150 occasions and probably even more than that. So um, I have known about Jeff for well over a decade uh, when I first doing some, you know, started doing some work in this, you know, the whole crash reconstruction area. Um, you know, he was cited many times at conferences and through people uh, that I had uh, connected with. So let me bring him on in here. And there he is. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Hello. Hello. How well, are you? you're, I'm good. Thank you. And uh, you're coming to us from uh, a sunny, San, somewhere in sunny San Diego, I believe. Yes. Yes. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm in San Diego from Connecticut. All right. Well, that's okay. Great. Um, well, look, Jeff, I want to just start at the beginning here and ask you about your beginnings and sort of the journey that you had through to where you are today. Um, before you got into, because I, I think your first exposure to like this whole uh, safety, uh, human behavior thing was probably with the psychology when you're working on the psycho psychology degree or, or master's. Um, but prior to that, because you have a, I believe it was a, just, a, it was a, a BA uh, and I can't remember the university now, but, um, Eastern Connecticut state university. Okay. So at that time, were you already thinking ahead or were you thinking I'm doing something else? No, you know what? I, uh, I started there. I, I was, I wanted to be a, uh, uh, a math teacher and a, and a baseball coach and oh, baseball, uh, baseball coach. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, so I, I played baseball there and I coached there eventually when it was clear I didn't have the talent to play. And, um, and uh, then I student taught and I was, I, you know, I student taught at the high school I went to and five different teachers came up to me and said, no, you don't want to be a teacher. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, but it's like, I do, I do want to be a teacher. And, and, uh, but, uh, they said, you know, uh, they really discouraged me from being a teacher. And, and so then I was scrambling after that uh, of what I wanted to do and, and, uh, ended up a police officer and, uh, 
And and uh, then uh, first day of the police academy, I called my wife and I said, I, I don't know if I like this either. <laughs> <laughs> and the second day of the police academy, the, uh, uh, the first class was crash investigation, crash reconstruction, mm -hmm. and he explained it. And I called home that night and I said to wife, my wife, I, I know what I want to do the rest of my life. And um, it was clear it was, it, you know, the had the teaching component involved and it had the math involved and and uh it, it, and and it was uh, excited it, you know it, it just excited me and uh, uh and so i've been in the field ever since and that was in uh that was in uh goodness june 1983. okay so then what about the so then the path into the psychology part how, how did that work uh, now I had heard Dr. Paul Olson speak a number of times and Dr. Bernie Abrams and Gerson Alexander, Jerry Alexander, for, uh, you know, formerly from uh, NHTSA. And, uh, you know, they were all the, you know, old time human factors, people, you know, experts that spoke to us crash reconstructionists and, um, and so I, I wanted to advance my degree and I just kept dabbling in a lot of different classes early on just to, you know, anatomy and CAD and and just to be a better crash reconstructionist. And and then I uh, I finally decided that I wanted a, an advanced degree. And and uh, so I had to decide road more traveled and that's the, uh, in, you know, engineering degree or the road less traveled is the human factors. And, and I noticed Paul Olson had a degree in experimental psychology. And, and so that's the route I took. Yeah, interesting. And at the time, because um, you say it's the road less traveled. So in terms of publications, in terms of understanding, in terms of the, the, the type of training and delivery that was there at the time, I mean, was there a, there was obviously a gap, there was something missing there. Is that something you noticed right away? Well, yeah, you know, interesting you say that. Uh, the, the Supreme Court ruling Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals comes out in 1993, laying out the groundwork of what an expert witness is. And one of the one of their findings, one of their criteria for an expert witness is you have to be able to cite your error rate. And so I immediately started going through my crash reports and thinking, all right, what is my error rate for each one of the things I'm doing in, in each crash? And then I got that a perception response time number. And, uh, and you know, some people had taught me, you know, yeah, just use 1.5. It's something near 1.5 and mm -hmm. use 1.5. So I'm interested in what what's the standard deviation of that 1.5? What's the range? What's the what's the normal range or error rate? Because I better know that. Yeah. And I started collecting studies, and that was in '93 where that ruling came out. And I started collecting studies almost immediately after that ruling came out in '93. And uh, I just started, you know, pouring through library and index medicus you know back in the day there was no internet you know so i had to go up to a library i'd get up there as soon as they opened the doors with a pocket full of dimes to make copies and <laughs> i'd go through index medicus and and try to find journals that mentioned reaction time or response time or recognition or you know i had to look for keywords and i would copy uh you know, maybe 30, 40 studies in that day, you know, find them in the morning, copy them in the afternoon, come home, maybe 10, 11 o'clock at night. And that, that would give me reading for about three months. And then I'd do it again. And, mm -hmm. and then when we get to 2002 or three, I recall the librarian saying to me, would you like me to, I couldn't find a study. So I asked her about it and she said, would you like me to email it to you? And to me, it was like I, I heard angels horns, you know, like, are you kidding me? I can get a study by email. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, and since then, it's been an explosion. Uh, there's been so much uh, research done since then. It's uh, it's 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 an exciting time to be uh, in in driver behavior research. Yeah, for sure. The uh, yeah, I was just thinking back. I think the first time I, I may have heard your name must, must have been at a. I think it was a Canadian uh, with a traffic accident investigators uh, association or something like that. That uh, oh, it's Cater. Cater was the Canadian version. So I remember, and you know, your name came up two, three, four times, and I said, "Hey, there's something going on." And then you know, the, you you mentioned the 1.5 seconds. And so um, let me ask you early on, when we talk about um, this perception reaction time that keeps coming up, what are, what are some of the common misconceptions uh, that maybe you believed when you first started and how have some of those changed over the past couple of decades? Well, the, the 1.5 second number, for example. So, uh, you know, I, I hear that it's, you know, it's commonly accepted and, and uh, when I do the research here and when I look at the historical literature and when I historical reaction time research, I find that that's never been true. It, it, that a few people uh, in the crash reconstruction community who didn't have a historical foundation took that number and ran with it. And, and, and it's been passed along like a wives tale and in fact, when we look back in the historical literature, it, from the very first reaction time study done, in, one of the first in 1868 by Franz Donders, where he used a hip chronoscope, which was essentially the world's first stopwatch that measured in milliseconds. He found that for different stimulus, there's a different response and a different response time. And if you change the number of characters, if you change the the complexity of the event, if you change the number of choices, if you change the response options, you change response time. And so, you know, taking this today, we can see we have routine cutoffs and we have somebody stopping right in front of you, which is simple responses. And then we have head-ons and U-turns and stop vehicles on highways, which are much more complex responses. Clearly, one number doesn't even start to define how response times have changed. And then a simple thing like if you and I go back in time and you start the clock when a driver crosses the stop line, and I stop the clock when that same driver crosses the road edge. But we both stop the cl- clock when the main road driver's brake lights go on. We're going to report different response times. Yeah. So the question is, which, 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 which starting point, which onset does the 1.5 second supply to? Right. And so that's, you know, that's one of the common misperceptions. Uh, so many other uh, myths that we've seen. And when I explain them to my classes, it's it's clear these, you know, everybody knows the correct answer. They just haven't thought of it that way before. Right, right. No, that makes sense. The, um, the, the, the graphic that I've just put up here is from a paper that you did in 2003. But I thought I, I would start with this because I think it's a nice, it has a nice flow, like talking about the different sort of uh, components here, uh, sort of in the overall picture. So the, you have the, the detection interval, you have perception reaction, you have movement, and then you have vehicle latency. And so could, could we, uh, or maybe could you break down briefly each of these components? And then I'd like to ask you maybe about sort of the mechanisms of the, you know, human factors that refer to detection and what we can see. Right. So first we have the detection or recognition threshold, and this is a prerequisite to a driver perceiving and responding in an emergency manner or non-emergency manner or not, or not perceiving at all. Right. So first you have to know the true character of something. And uh, so some people, you know, might argue, well, as soon as I see a flicker of light, I should know that I should slow down. And 
I will point out that we see flickers of light all the time, but no one locks up their brakes and smokes the tires only to say, oh, I guess that was a false positive. I guess, uh, you know, I guess I've had too much coffee today. And uh, so we have to know the true character, not just the pedestrian, but the pedestrians facing the road and walking into my path. And then we get into the perception response time phase. That's where the drivers are categorizing the hazard as a, as a well, or that's where the drivers have categorized the hazard as a, an immediate hazard and, and subsequent gave us a, an emergency response or a non-immediate hazard. And if in those instances, that's a speed choice issue. So the drivers perhaps selected a, a different speed choice or a different lane position, or they just did not perceive a, a need to respond at all. And then we get to the movement time, and that's typically steering time, hand movement time, or leg movement time. And so foot foot to the from the throttle to the to the brake. And now these two phases here in the darker gray, clearly, and, and really all these phases, this part of uh, the response, you know, the cognitive part of the response affects the limb movement time of the response. So we see uh, over and over again that uh, if if a driver's faced with a very complex response, a, a lower probability event like a head-on crash or, or, or a U-turn or a stop vehicle on a highway, the movement time is going to be a little bit longer uh, and the vehicle latency time. So vehicle latency is from the moment they touch the brake, how long does it take them to get 0.4 G or more braking, in other words, hard braking. And, uh, and so we see some, some text message studies, some distracted driver studies, where l l the time to press the brake gets much longer when the driver gets confused. Right? And, uh, and so it is sort of kind of a, a, a cognitive cueing that goes on. <laughs> so some have suggested that there's a decision-making phase. And I think based on my explanation, you can see there's decision-making phases all through the response. Mm -hmm. And uh, that we're, you know, we're constantly processing the information and constantly uh, doing, you know, measuring how the response is working. Okay. Let me ask you about the, so on the detection interval, so um, you have to see what it is you have to avoid, right? So obviously there's a lighting uh, component here, whether it's daytime or nighttime, and that's the, the one that's, I, I, that's typically faced. But of course there's weather, there's, there may be, you know, it's raining heavily or, or, or whatever. Um, so when it comes to when it comes to nighttime cases, because I mean, that, that's got to be quite common where just somebody you know, you see something, you've done some work in that area. And I'm, I'm going to bring up some of the studies after I want to ask you some specific questions about that, or maybe you can help me uh, explain some of that. But um, let's say you are, uh, let, let's say you want to study this, and, and you want to place somebody on a roadway, and you want to determine how far or how close somebody is. Uh, what is it that, um, like, what, what could a person who's a, an accident reconstructionist do to help determine how far you could see somebody at night? Like what, what would be a good test and how would you set that up? Well, it, you know, the first, one of the first things I'd ask is, or, or that we should ask ourselves is, if, is the road lit or not lit? And so there's been quite a bit of research about how drivers recognize pedestrians or other objects on, on lighted or unlighted roads. So if you're, if you're, let's start with the simple unlighted road, unlit road, we go out. And what we want to do is, is establish whether we are applying the research properly to the facts of the case. And so we go out there and perhaps we will put a target in the contact area 
you know, or I should say near the contact area. So the area of impact is where the crash happened, but not where avoidance could have occurred. So you want to consider where was the pedestrian or object coming from and, and, and evaluate a target in that area. And so what we want to, what I want to do when I go out to a site is, is I want to evaluate what it looks like to me and perhaps take some demonstrative uh, photographs. But more importantly, I want to make sure I'm applying the research properly to the facts of the case. I want to make sure there isn't any, uh, any glare sources. I want to make sure there isn't any uh, contrast issues where the perhaps the pedestrian is wearing white, but they're uh, standing in front of a white fence. <laughs> so you think, oh, white a pedestrian wearing white at night. Oh, this is, you know, you okay. should recognize them for more than 300 feet away. And yet they're standing in front of a white fence right where the road curves and they disappear. You know, so you want to make sure, oh, I want to make sure I'm applying it properly to the facts of that case in right, that right. environment. So obviously, and, uh, obviously, uh, if you have the same clothing the pedestrian has and you know more or less where they were crossing the street or something like that, and you have a similar vehicle, similar eye height, maybe similar conditions at night or whatever it might be. So establishing all those variables as best as you can. And then, uh, so, and this was actually a question that came in from, from uh, an accident reconstructionist. And that was, you know, as you start approaching, what, uh, how do you define the range? Like, so there's going to be a point where you just kind of see something and it's like, yeah, maybe or whatever. And then there's, there's maybe a point where like, yeah, definitely I see the person now, you know? So I, I guess it's not a specific point. It must be some kind of a range. Well, see, that's really not a study, right? That's an observation, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, a lot of crash reconstructionists believe that their nighttime reenactment is a study and it's, it's really not. It's not following accepted methodology. An accepted methodology is to consider that the target is there and the target is not there, right? And uh, and so it's hard to unring a bell if you know what the target looks like. Right. For example, when when we've done research of all the other studies, we've found that the studies that showed their participants what the target is going to look like, what the pedestrian was going to look like, and then tested them, their results overestimated road recognition distances by more than 137 feet. Really? So understand that we don't want to be biasing ourselves to this. So again, what I do is I'll put the target or I'll put the contrast gradient, uh, you know, like an eye chart out at the area of impact. If I can't do that, I'll, I'll, I'll try to put some target at the, near the, uh, or adjacent to the area of impact, but I'm not looking at it. I'm looking to the left and the right, left or the right of it. Mm -hmm. And noting at what point do I, am I able to discern the shape, the pattern, because we know in nature, pattern works you know a tree frog with no self-defense uh continues to evolve even though he's a tasty morsel to everybody else in the in, in the in the ecosystem right so he continues to evolve because he has a a bad pattern he has camouflage and so we know pattern works so if we once we can detect the pattern i've noticed anecdotally that doing it that way many times when i'm out at a site it matches what the unbiased research has said okay. and so the unbiased researchers are first bet so if you're asking me my my professional opinion i'm thinking to myself what does the research say right really no one no one's interested in knowing what jeff mutart's opinion is they want to know my professional opinion and uh, so I'm out there to try to see how to apply the unbiased research. And by not looking at the target, that's my way of trying to estimate it into 
somewhat buttress the the research. Okay. Yeah, it's it's just it's difficult when you are the the person that's working on the case and tr you know what the person's wearing, you know where to expect them, and then trying to drive it yourself and trying to be objective, right? That's right. A, if I if if I showed you the the tree frog sitting in the tree inches from your face, then you'd say, oh oh yeah, it's visible, mm -hmm. right? But it's not recognizable, right? No, and 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 another thing we've found regarding lights is objects that are even visible and recognizable are not you can you must localize but uh, you must recognize but you must also localize so floating lights uh, you know like slow moving triangles yes perhaps you can see it from 600 feet away but it's going to be very very difficult a single triangle knowing where, where that is right and uh and so if a driver just thinks it's a a red light that's off the road, you're not going to get any slowing at all. Well, somebody say, if you don't know what it is, why don't you slow down? Well, you don't know what a million lights out there are. And if we slow down, we'd never get anywhere. You yeah. know, say. so there's, there's a, clearly there's a hindsight bias component to a, a, the thinking of a lot of people. Let me ask you about the targets, and then what we'll do is I'll just we'll move on to the perception reaction. But uh, I'll, I'll try to see if I can find it online. Uh, was, was there a place you know where I can maybe while you're you're, you're talking about the targets set up, um, is it on, up on the website? Because I'll see if I can bring it up for people to have a look at. What what you mean the contrast gradient? The contrast gradient, yeah. Yeah, I, I, that is on the website. Um, okay, I'll see if I, I'll see if I can find it while you're uh, you're talking. But can, maybe you can you talk about how you use the contrast gradient? Yeah, it's it's uh, essentially an eye, like an eye chart, and it has light. Uh, it has dark colors on light colors, and light colors on dark colors, and 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 grays on darks, and and uh, and and light grays on whites. And so it's testing contrast, and it's tens, you know. Uh, and so you put that out at a location where you can only make out half of them. And and that has assisted me in in knowing how to reproduce my photographs later. So now I want to reproduce the photograph, whether it's a print image or on a good monitor or on a bad monitor. I can I know how to lighten and darken the 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 final output to match what I recall seeing. And in my notes, it'll say what what I saw of that. And now I, I have something to reproduce. Right. Okay. Now that makes sense. Uh, let's move on to the uh, perception reaction. What can you tell me about the uh, sort of the, the, the human aspect about perception and reaction? What What's going on for somebody? Because this is, if I'm correct, or, or you correct me if I'm wrong, but this is where somebody has to start making decisions about, okay, I see something, but it's after you see something, right? That's what happens at that point. Yeah, see, you see, we've sort of, in our research, we've worked backwards, right? We don't know what drivers think, right? We have a, you know, we have a black box in the car in, 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 a, in a lot of trucks, and we can download that, and we can see what the, what the vehicle was thinking, but we don't have an EEG, right? Mm -hmm. And we can't download an, e, you know, electronic encephalogram, we can't download the brain and, and see what the driver was thinking or what, what neurons were doing. And so we want to stay away from that. And instead, what we've done is we've worked back and said, well, we don't know what the driver was thinking, but the fact that he gave us an emergency response there means he recognized an emergency event. If he only slowed, he must have recognized only a non-emergency event. And if he didn't respond at all, he must not have recognized the need, you know, for a, a moderate speed loss, right? So we, we've backed into that from how drivers have responded. And so all our research and all the research of others, we're basically measuring overt behavior. So we know the side road driver crossed the stop line here, the main road driver hit the brake lights here. And so we know there's something going on in the vehicle uh, but not necessarily what we know when the brake lights are 
are are when they hit the brake lights here and in when when they hit the brake lights here instead of here uh so later in the event than any other driver then we assume something's going on up here in the brain right mm -hmm. so it's uh it's uh it, it's pretty clear that when drivers are slower to respond then likely distraction or or other things age uh, intoxication or other things were involved. You know? Right. No, that makes sense. Is there a, what would you say is, is sort of like a, a, a minimum number where just it's nobody's, nobody's going to work around this because it's just too quick for people to sort of make a decision on, on even in the best of conditions, let's say. Well, the fastest response time events we've seen is somewhere in the, in the 0 0.4, 0 0.5 second region. And that's usually intersection path intrusions side road driver coming in very fast and uh that's that's about the fastest response time events we've seen sometimes in cutoff scenarios if the intruding cutoff vehicle is diving in very sharply you'll get the the driver in the correct lane in or in his proper lane responding very quickly in the 0.5 region but generally the cutoffs you know somebody two drivers traveling same direction one cuts off the other that's usually the fastest response time followed by following too closely uh followed by intersection path intrusion with somebody coming in fast mm -hmm. but we've seen a couple fast ones there is that, and it, is that because maybe as somebody's approaching an intersection or something, they have a heightened awareness or they have a heightened concern. So they're now, now they're a little bit more attentive or. Well, and, and, and that's exactly what we've seen. We, we, we've had some video where the driver on the main road sees the, the side road driver coming in very fast and it does startle them. And in fact, you know, we, we had a video of one gentleman he's literally pointing at the side road vehicle and and swearing at him and saying you better stop you better stop yet not slowing for him right mm -hmm. and we see this quite often the main road driver continues to drive because he has the right of way and they they do drive uh, normally and 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 not until the it's clear that the side road driver is not going to obey the law do the main road drivers hit the brakes and we see this repeated in in naturalist you know in the real life drivers but then we've seen it re this same effect repeated in simulator studies by university of iowa dawn marshall at university of iowa and perone uh and so they found the same thing that sometimes have the drivers have the delay you know wait and see i hope the other guy does the right thing kind of approach Right. Well, let's move on to the movement uh, part here. So when, movement, I'm assuming that this is now where a decision has been made to, I, I don't know, make a, a steering input or, or brake or, or whatever. So is, is that, is that what, what defines the limit of this particular phase? Well, this is usually when you first hand movement up to maximum steering, right? uh, maximum amplitude of the steering wheel, or foot off the throttle to the to brake application. Okay. And and some people think that steering is faster and essentially uh, imagine my feet are matching my hands when my hands go from here to here, right? It matches my my foot going from here to here, right? So it's uh, essentially the research has uh, been pretty consistent. This time is usually somewhere between 0.3 to 0.7 seconds, usually darn near 0.5 seconds uh, to, you know, for, to go from here to here. So imagine this, a driver is steering, he goes from here to here in a half second, but the, and then starts coming back, but he hasn't hit the dashed line yet. So if he's in the right lane going left, it usually takes them in an emergency about one second to get to the dashed line, but their hands are already coming back a half second into the steer. Mm -hmm. So, and that, but I'll, I'll point out, that's what normal drivers do. 
right? That's what uh, attend drivers who are not engaged in texting, drivers who are above age 25, that's what normal drivers do. What teen drivers do and what, you know, texting and, and dialing drivers do has been different. And we've seen that in the, in the research is that they're more susceptible to steering and oversteering. Okay. So the movement, just so I'm clear though, uh, so the, the, the cutoff where you break away from perception reaction to movement, movement is actually where it has, the, 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 the movement has actually started. Like you're already, so it's not anything regarding you're still deciding or there's, there's, you know, or you've decided now there's, you know, sort of a neural signal going through your body. It's actually when the physical turning, it, turning or moving. Okay. Right. You get some move. Yeah. You were getting actual physical response there. Okay. And then from there, vehicle latency. So you, you start, but you, the mechanical part of the vehicle or the, you know, the braking has to somehow take effect, right? The friction. Yeah, and, and, yeah. And, and, but here's, here's the, here's the complication here. This is referred to as a psychomotor phase. And so yes, there's a mechanical component, but there's also a cognitive component and so here, if I took you in the back parking lot of a closed business and we did test getting from brake application to 0.4 G or more from brake application to hard, hard braking, you can knock that out in like a 10th of a second, maybe 0.15 seconds. But as soon as I have you responding to an emergency hazard event, that time now goes up to 0.3 seconds. Mm. And it's very consistent. We, we've seen it in simulator studies. We've seen it in, in uh, a study of 3,500 drivers throughout the US who have been monitored for three years. They, they typically take about 0.3 seconds to get from, from braking to when they get hard braking. So a lot of people think that, you know, emergency events slam on the brakes, right? And it doesn't work that way. It many times drivers have a two phase response. They break normally and then harder, or they edge their way down. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's different types of behaviors there, but that point three number seems to capture what how they're doing that. Okay, and so the maneuver is that it, does that sort of close back on itself? Cause you sort of have to start keep, you have to be aware, you, start, you have to start detecting again, right? You go, okay, what's going on again? So you have to reevaluate the scenario and then you have to make new decisions. You have to make new movements again. Well, it, it, well, the maneuver is, you know, the human factors end of the maneuver is, is what the driver chooses to do, whether that okay. be swerving or braking. Uh, and uh, essentially, you know, the fear, the, the, fight or flight factor comes into play where we tend to flee from our danger. So if we're going to steer, we're going to steer away from the, the hazard. Uh, if it, so, but the maneuver is, is the physical evidence that the police officer is, is likely measuring that. So the vehicle swerved this far laterally, he skidded this far longitudinally. And uh, so that's the maneuver, but, what the maneuver is going to be depends on many times what what the hazard is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, let me let me show something here because I, I want to get into some of the research that you're doing, and I I'd like to start sort of some of the early research that you started, and then we can lead up to maybe some of the more recent stuff that you've done here. Um, so so what was I mean? There's some papers here. So this one, development and evaluation of driver response time predictors based upon. Uh, meta-analysis. So this is where you, I think you gathered a whole bunch of data from different studies, and then you're starting to look at, uh, you know, sort of pulling out some information or, uh, from this. So, um, what, so what, what was going on at that time that had you doing this? Well, remember 10 years before that is the Daubert ruling it, where, uh, you know, I'm, I'm running around trying to collect studies and, and, uh, and deciding, you know, how, uh, you know, what's the range of response times? What's the error rate? And uh, starting to collecting, start collecting research that I went back for the master's degree in 95. And uh, right from the start, my goal was to try to narrow down 
what was the standard deviation of driver's response times? And, you know, what was the range? And I started collecting studies. And uh, by the time I published this paper, I believe there's 129 perception response time studies in there. And uh, that, you know, I coded for 24 different variables at that time, whether it be what kind of response they had, where was the hazard, and I'm trying to see if there's some kind of trends. And uh, quite frankly, this was that was a seven-year project. Throughout most of that project, there was more failures than successes <laughs> until I categorized them by crash type. So I, when I put the path intrusions with the path intrusions and the lead vehicle events with the lead vehicle events and traffic signals with traffic signals, all of a sudden you can see trends developing, you can see that we can now see how drivers very predictably responded to those events. I see. But until then, till my advisor, Dr. Breyer, said to me, you know, it, for my original database, he goes, my God, Jeff, you're trying to a average avocados with, with elephants. <laughs> and because I had all different types of response time, but every other researcher up to that time was doing the same thing. And then I looked into different crash types, path intrusions, lead vehicle, you know, rear ender with traffic signals. And now we can start seeing, wow, there's, there's trends here. There's the drivers respond similarly in those crash types. Okay. So when you were talking about, so, cause originally I think in the abstract, it, it talks about like you were trying to analyze everything uh, sort of overall as an accurate predictor, but it, it couldn't be developed. And then you went into smaller sets. So those smaller sets are these, these categories that you're breaking out. Right. Okay. Okay. And then, and then you also did, well, I think it's, it's a two part study, right? Like you compared the, these smaller subsets uh, or groups to, was it actual video that you had or crash did crash did you Right. Have? And, and that was the other thing is, is what do I compare this to in the end? And, uh, I, I was asked to speak at a, uh, like a DOT conference in Ohio and one of the vendors was from the Kentucky transportation cabinet. And, uh, I keep hearing in the, in the vending room, uh, sk skidding and squealing and bang, you know, and, and, uh, I keep hearing these videos of crashes and I go over it and I said, where are you getting all these crashes from? And he says, well, we have safety cameras at several locations and, and, uh, and, and we record our, the, the safety, these, these cameras record 24 seven, but if they detect a crash event, skidding tires, squealing tires, or, or a crash, it saves the four seconds before and four seconds after the event. And, uh, and, and we, we collect this. And I said, is there any way I can get my hands on that? And, and thank goodness, the Kentucky transportation cabinet were very, very helpful as long uh, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Pesayan from Helsinki, Finland, who was doing the same thing over there and uh, and shared all his original real life driver response data and okay. through video. And, and we uh, and we analyzed it frame by frame and and compared the responses. You, you have this other paper here in 2005, and it talks about the relationship between relative velocity detection and driver response times in following situations. So you're talking about the, you know, a lead vehicle, somebody behind, and then they're moving along. And you, you talk about, for example, the fact that uh, is it one quarter or maybe one fifth of accidents are often uh, rear enders, right? Like, uh, or is it the fatalities? Um, yeah, uh, approximately. Yeah, every year, somewhere 24, 25 percent of all crashes are, are rear end crashes. But uh, what's the scary part is that uh, today two people will die in the United States from a crash of approximately uh, 55 to 60 miles an hour into a vehicle that's driving zero to 10 miles an hour. Mm. That single, those, that single event of, you know, somewhere, somebody traveling 60 into somebody traveling near zero it's going to happen twice today uh, on average, and, and they're going to die from that crash. And so that's essentially what 
that's the crash type I'm I'm interested in in that in that research. Okay, and this particular study was I mean it was two thousand and five, so it, it's getting on now. But um, what what was the outcome of this particular study? Was just that you were trying to quantify those numbers? Yeah, and, and so here's here's my hypothesis. Here is that when you're at a long distance away, and, and the question is, how do we measure response time here? And we have to start response time from some stop line or some imaginary line on the road and say, okay, we're going to start the clock from here. And most people have used what they refer to as a looming threshold, a mathematically calculated uh, location in, you know, a line in the sand where you can measure response time from and where drivers recognize they're closing at a dangerous rate. And so I'm trying to identify where that is. And so I thought to myself that wouldn't that be the point where response times level off to a very fast point? Response times will remain high until we get to a point where we're really scared. And then we don't get really, really, really scared and really, 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 really scared. We're just really scared, right? So, <laughs> okay. and, and response time will level off. And, and sure enough, we did a, 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 a little simulator study and we found those numbers, and then we looked at all the other research, and they also found, you know, we, we see the literature also shows that. And so uh, we can see that, yes, sure enough, response time will remain high until we recognize we have a real big problem. Yeah. Um, you've talked about the, the, the sort of the, the perception, and of course, with... Um, different variables, it becomes uh, more difficult to determine if there's going to be a problem or not. So nighttime, fog, weather, and also different types of distractions. So uh, one here, uh, I thought this was a pretty good paper, uh, driving without a clue. And so this one had to do with a, uh, a simulation. So you were doing like a simulation where uh, people were given some kind of a task, uh, like maybe uh, they were asked some short sentences or something like that, and they had to have like a hands-free call. But can you tell me about like how you simulated this particular uh, event and then, or for the yeah, study? Th th this yeah, was, this was quite a complex uh, study. It was actually two simulator studies and a, a, and a field study where we had drivers driving through Amherst, Massachusetts, and we, on a road that was closed, but the subjects didn't know it was closed, we actually set up a work zone. So the whole idea here was where do you put a variable message sign to attract the attention of a moderately distracted driver? And, uh, and so we were, we were testing that, and the moderately distracted driver was a driver with a cognitive task and we asked them five word sentences like the apple, uh, well, the boy delivered the paper and you'd have to answer, yes, that made sense. And then I'd ask you last word and you'd say paper, but then I'd ask you the apple fried the onion and you'd answer, no, that doesn't make sense. And then I'd ask you last word and you'd say onion, right? And so that was the, that was the cognitive task. And, and we found that even that was uh, challenging to some drivers, especially when give, those sentences were given at a faster rate. And so you can see that the intensity of the conversation can play a part in, in, in drivers' responses. And also where you place the variable message sign can play a part in uh, attracting uh, attention or or what the other thing we found is for bad performance performers who are distracted uh distracted drivers if you put more in their environment they become more distracted yeah, and, sure. uh, and and so it's uh it, it's tough sometimes to get the attention of a distracted driver. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, there's something going on with your audio right now. It sounds like uh, there's like a Darth Vader locked in a box somewhere behind you as well. I can hear you clearly, but there's something else going on. I don't know if you can just kind of maybe mute yourself and then try to come back again or something and see if that fixes the issue. Because it just clicked. It might have been an internet issue or something like that. But uh, let's see if we can 
it's not that that bad, but it is. Uh, some people noted here that there's some kind of an audio issue. So I don't know if you're hearing me okay or if, if I'm having the same issue. Maybe some of the people on the comments can let me know if there's a problem with my audio as well or if they we're just hear hearing it on Jeff's side. All right. But, uh, is, is that better? No, I can still hear it again. Let me just try something very quickly. I'm going to see if I, if I remove you here and then bring you back. Um, remove you there and let's see. Okay. You there? Yes. Okay. No, it's still there, unfortunately. Um, well, look, let me, let me just keep going here, but, um, I want to move forward to 2021 and some of the, um, work that you've been doing because you've continued on with some of the, uh, driver responses to lead vehicles. And you've also done more work in the area of, um, uh, the influence of age, secondary tasks and other factors on, on drivers. And this one says swerving responses before crash or near crash. So obviously, um, there's, there's a bit of a gap there. I know you've done some other things in between, but this is 2021. So this is fairly recent. So can you tell me a little bit about what you found in some of these particular studies? Yeah. So, so here we were interested, essentially we ended up finding a, a, a couple of things that we're, we're interesting, interested here in that looming threshold that I just discussed. What is the triggering point that whether you're, using a driverless vehicle or a driver, manual driver vehicle, mm -hmm. what triggers an emergency response? And, and what influences that? And so what we found for a easily identified hazard, once, once you get a recognizable hazard, age has not been a factor in the emergency response phase of the response. Where we see age being a factor is the ability to recognize hazards, all right? And so uh, in the perception response, not as much. And then the next thing we looked into, so many people address hands-free and handheld and, and, and use cognitive tasks as if they're conversations, including my own study that you just brought up. And then, uh, and then texting and, and, and dialing and like visual and manual secondary tasks. And we wanted to know how that affected simply lead vehicle response time. So looking at how driver, how cell phone tasks influence drivers in, in rear end crash configurations. And essentially we found that hands-free and handheld conversation did not have a significant effect at all in in driver response time. However, a cognitive task did. So it's telling us normal conversations aren't gonna bother you, but if you're arguing with your spouse or significant other, right? Or if you're uh, in an intense conversation about details of, of directions, yes, it, it, could have, it could affect your performance. And then of course, there's no study ever published that doesn't say texting and dialing and visual and manual and reaching away isn't a, a distractor. In fact, we found that the average texter is slower than 93% of normal drivers. Hmm. And, and uh, so that's, that's pretty, pretty scary when you say you're just by, just by reaching for your phone and swiping it, you've just made yourself slower and, and, and less intelligent than 93% of the population. Yeah, that makes sure. Um, can, you, can you comment on the types of decisions that people make uh, you know, to avoid danger? Because I think in one of the studies you had talked about, for example, it's heuristic. Uh, the, you know, the, the decision making is, is heuristic. It's not like you pick the best course of action. You react and you try to figure it out really quickly and you kind of go and sometimes uh, you know, people will maybe put themselves in a more hazardous situation based on their decisions. So what, what can you talk about the decision process there? Right. So a lot of these emergency response time events, we're talking about, you know, one second or two second emergency response time. And then even if somebody is slower than normal, but still in the normal range, it's probably maybe up to two and a half, 2.7. Right. So imagine this thousand one, thousand two, thousand three. And 
and the, and the driver is already skidding, right? So that's usually worst case scenario. But now as a crash investigator or in a post te- te- crash in investigation, somebody will spend 30 hours analyzing every possible outcome and every possible choice. And that's referred to as an algorithmic response. Mm -hmm. So a driver is usually going to give us an intuitive response. That's when, whenever you, you're going to get an intuitive response, it's going to be fast, but it's going to be susceptible to some common errors. Right. And one of those is the difference reduction, the fight, fight or flight, you know, uh, which is called difference reduction, right? And uh, so we see this, that we have typical errors that we do as humans. Those are, those are normal human beings though, right? Mm-hmm. So, and, and so many times we, I, I hear, well, the driver should have considered a different, a different option, but then they attribute the same reaction time to it. And I say, wait, wait, if you're going to expect the driver to evaluate one more additional response option, go back to the very first reaction time study done in 1868. When you increase the response options, you increase the response time. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so everybody in the world could eventually make all the most optimal response choices if you give them 30 hours to do it. Right. So. But on roads where somebody cuts you off, we we don't have that luxury. And so we end up with driver behaviors. And this is one reason why some automated, you know, automated drivers have potential to improve on the human performance in some areas. Yeah. Hey, we're we're getting a little bit on in time, but uh, let me ask you just a few more questions. And one of them is um, in terms of your research and sort of uh, the path that you're headed. What, what are some of the future things that you're looking at doing and studying? Oh goodness, uh, we are uh, we we have quite a few nighttime recognition studies uh, planned, in, in as well as perception response time studies planned in the next two years. Uh, you know, in our night recognition studies, we've been using occlusion panels as a safe way to control the expectancy of a driver. Uh, You can control the expectancy of a driver by controlling the amount of time they can see the forward roadway. So if you only give them three tenths of a second to look and we give them a quick, uh, you see, you don't see, and we ask them, do you see anything in the road up ahead? Uh, We've found that this method uh, uh, gives us numbers that are very consistent with what real life drivers have how real life drivers have responded. And then uh, with the perception response time, what we're, uh, we're going forward more with how each crash type has uh, its own behaviors associated with it. And, uh, and so for example, for, for, for rear end crashes, the number one factor in a rear end crash is the following distance. The further back you are, the longer your response time. But following distance isn't a factor at all if somebody cuts you off or or a path intrusion. Mm -hmm. So each crash type has its own uh, variables. And 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 so we want to explore each one of those even further than we have and uh, and and to get, you know, give crash investigators uh, a, a, a robust understanding of of how drivers behave in the crashes they're investigating. Yeah. With, with the sort of introduction of these self-driving cars and, and other things like that, do you see opportunities where, you know, the, the, the vehicle or maybe for example, artificial intelligence and other things are going to be helping drivers, assisting drivers uh, would, would be one question. The second question I have is, uh, is there anything in the research that you see that is an opportunity to improve or reduce the risk of, these accidents and the way that, that people make decisions? Well, you know, it has to be an integrated system. You know, we have to have the traffic engineers working with the human factors people, working with the police, right? And 
and sometimes uh, clearly uh, the 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 uh, reconstruction uh, the pl police reconstructions are not being listened to or and sometimes the the uh, the police and, and in some instances the police aren't trained enough to do the reconstruction to give the human factors and and other people so uh, and and that could be true of all the sectors. But if all the sectors get together and, and have a better communication, a better improvement, uh, I, I think that's one way. But uh, so many, like, for example, uh, the, the human factors community are investigating rear end crashes of two drivers following closely behind one another, yet that leads to nearly no crashes. No, nearly no fatal crashes. Mm. And, um, and so the fatal, as I said before, the average fatal crash is a 57 into 12. And, um, and so th we, there's, there's a handful of, of, of researchers throughout the world that are looking into that crash type. And, and, and I give them credit that there's good research in that regard, but I would like to see a lot more you okay. know, considering that. Let me, let me just see if there's a couple. There's, there was a question here from Cheryl. Cheryl, I'm going to bring your question up if you're looking. I think this goes back to the conversation we had when you were talking about, you know, a vehicle approaching the intersection and then, you know, there's a there's a vehicle coming into. Uh, how do you determine when it's actually clear that the intruding vehicle will not stop? Cheryl, great question. You don't, right? And here and here's why. Because if you're evaluating where you think the driver will stop or don't stop, then we're putting our own biases into that investigation. We want to instead use a landmark like the stop line or a similar location, right? And uh, uh, the, the research says without a stop line, generally drivers roll up to a position about two meters or six feet from the curved road edge before they start out. And so if you use that as a starting point, and if that side road driver is starting from a stop, you use a longer response time uh, for that intersection path intrusion near 1.5. If he's not, you use one, a shorter response time. The average has been 1.2 for somebody that's rolling into the intersection. So, yes, do we know somebody that rolls in will uh, get responded to faster? Yes, but use a landmark. Don't try to imagine when perception occurred. All we know is that we measured overt, overt behavior from this position to when the main, uh, main road brake lights went on. And that's that's how we were just reporting the data. Yeah, you, you had talked about uh, training before briefly. And so I wanna just talk about, the, you've got sort of two websites here and I'd like to mention the fact that you do in fact do training and such. So uh, can you tell, let's talk about just craft, uh, crashsafetyresearch.com. So that that's where you're doing all the work from, all the research. Yeah, the, we're we're doing the research here uh, with this group and uh, and in our uh, consulting, okay. and uh, and I, I I have to give Swarup Dinaker uh, a a shout out because uh, he he is he is my colleague uh, that uh, you'll notice almost every study I have I'm either author or co-author with Swarup. And the uh, the other one is crash uh, crashsafetysolutions.com. So, is if people were interested in training and things like that, is this this is where they would go? Yeah, that's that's the training website. So there we have training solutions and and uh, software and and things that you know uh, crash investigators and safety officials and health departments and and uh, manu vehicle manufacturers have used the software for. Uh, for counterfactual analysis to see, you know, our car did this, what does a human do? And that's, you know, uh, and so that's essentially what the program is. It's what the, what, it's what the drivers have, have done. So the, uh, so the software here, it just, it, you, you sort of lay out the scenario and enter a bunch of different variables, and then it, it tries to go in and, and make a, give you some kind of a, a confidence interval or some kind of a, a range. Yeah, so you put in the crash type you have. So let's say you have an intersection path intrusion, uh, daytime, and the and the side road driver did not stop. And so you put that in there, and it'll tell you what research has been done in that regard, and what and what and what 
the study said the average response time has been and what the range of response times have been. And so we just simply shine light on the great research that's been done in the human factors and in transportation engineering community. And so what, what uh, do you offer like a number of different types of training programs or just a few or what, what do you typically offer? What are the different ones available? Oh, we, we have a pretty intensive one week course that's a, a human factors for crash reconstruction. And, and we pretty much address uh, all different types of ways to, to, uh, to use accepted methodologies to apply in your objective analysis of driver's responses. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have the software training classes and, uh, and we offer those as well. And uh, so, uh, and, and then, of course, there's webinars. So pretty much we, we try to make sure that whatever, you know, we, we service from OEMs, you know, from vehicle manufacturer engineers to, to police officers on the street, uh, whatever their need is for information on how drivers behave, we we try to give them a solution to uh, be able to address their their concerns. Okay. Last question, and that is at the very beginning, I talked about the fact that some of the work you're doing, I can see how this can be applied in other areas. So, have you in fact uh, ever been asked to do things in other areas, like I don't know, like officer-involved shootings, or maybe it's a uh, aircraft crash investigation, or or anything like? Uh, civil cases where there's other types of accidents that maybe are not related to a specific vehicle, but maybe heavy equipment, something like that? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I have been uh, asked to, to address two uh, plane crashes, you know, one here in the U.S. and one in Australia. And, um, and, and I did, the one here in the U.S. was, was a nighttime uh, where a pilot couldn't see the taxiway. Uh, and then in the uh, in Australia, it was a pilot that uh, uh, took off a, and engine failure and, and one second later made the decision to take off as opposed to land. And uh, and they I, I believe they expected the pilot to instantly land, which I don't think was reasonable. Um, and. Uh, they didn't want to hear that. So, <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, but, uh, so we've used it for, uh, for, uh, uh, Marine crashes. And I know some people have used, uh, our research for, for Marine crashes. Uh, and we have been contacted a number of times regarding police shootings mm -hmm. and, um, uh, how, however, we, we haven't, uh, we haven't been a part of those cases. We just assist, uh, those who who are part of the, those cases regarding uh, reaction time and and perception and uh, and movement times. Okay, great. Well, I'm not going to ask you another question, but there's one last question that somebody here, and it's related to your training. And I, I asked you this offline, but I'll ask you online. And it's about online training. Do you offer anything uh, which is online? Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, we just finished an online class here, and it, you know, it's both online and live. You know, I'm, that's why I'm here in San Diego. We, were, we had a, a training forum here, uh, but um, we have more training uh, with North, Northwestern University in coming up in June. Uh, and uh, if you see the CrashSafetySolutions.com website, all our upcoming training, whether it be online and and in person, is is always listed there. So. And if you contact them, any any live class we have, we could always consider uh, making it an online component as well. Excellent. Well, look, Jeff, that's uh, I think that does it. I, you definitely went over your you know, my, or the time. I was I wasn't sure I was going to keep you that long, but I really appreciate uh, all the information and just great information, great studies. And do me a favor, please hang back a little bit because I, I just do have a couple more questions for you offline. I think that'd be interesting, but. Thank you so much for the information. Really appreciate it. Oh, great. Thank you, Eugene. All right. Take care.
All right, everyone, that does it for this episode. Uh, really great information there. Um, yeah, I hope uh, that uh, there's going to be more. And I think uh, we're going to invite Jeff back uh, in the near future when he does some more studies here. Uh, so only thing I have left is really just uh, don't forget about that Cloud Compare course that's coming up. If you're interested, uh, go ahead, go to the website, uh, sign up, and hopefully we will see you there. But that pretty much does it for this episode. And so I want to wish everybody uh, a great evening, great day, depending on where you are. And hopefully we'll see you next week. So take care, everybody, and uh, we'll wish you all the best. Bye-bye.